What we're doing is putting a roof over this patio. There's a whole lot of work to go and there's gonna be a second video. All right, so it's been a while, but finally I'm back for part two. And in this one, I wanna show you how I finished up the awning, give you some of my thoughts and explain some things. And then also, ultimately, I want to give you a price breakdown of roughly what it costs to build something like this, just in case you're thinking about doing something similar. So the final thing I did last fall after making the part one video was to start in on the electrical. And to do that, I started by installing can lights or these recessed lights in the ceiling. I have four of these on either side spaced out pretty evenly. And as of right now, they're only being screwed in temporarily. I'm not 100% sure where these are going to go on the ceiling because I want to make sure that they line up nicely with the tongue and groove boards that I'm going to install later. I thought these can lights were pretty cool because they were at an angle. Um, and they're, they're awesome because they adjust to different pitches of ceilings. And the cool thing is they keep the bulb perpendicular to the floor so that the light is always shining straight down, not at an angle like some of the other fixtures that are out there. If you've seen any of my other videos before, you know that I don't claim to be an electrician, so I'm not going to get too crazy into the, the wiring process here. But I am wiring the can lights together, and I'm leaving myself quite a bit of extra wire so that when I have to move these later, I'm going to have enough play so I don't cut myself short here. Then while I'm up here, I'm also screwing in light bulbs. Important to note, these are kind of like a high output outdoor light. Uh, so each one of these gives off like 14 or 1500 lumens, and they're definitely going to give us plenty of light out here. Then this is the part where we skip right over winter and go straight into the spring where I'm starting off with more electrical. You can see that I have two receptacles up there in Ethernet for all the TV and other electrical stuff that I'm going to be plugging in. I ran electrical down each one of the posts into a weatherproof box with a GCFI and a weatherproof cover. Uh, you can see that the wire I'm using here is a fully shielded, outdoor, wet-rated wire. One important thing to note is all of these receptacles that are on the poles are on their own 20-amp circuit. And then the older receptacle that was on the house, and then the can lights and ceiling fans are on their own 20-amp breaker. Uh, so that I'm not going to have any problems with power draw out here. We should never worry about setting off a breaker. And then you can see up here I have the two boxes set up for the ceiling fans. One of them has a light bulb in it temporarily just for the electrical inspection. Then to get the real work started I went and got the workbench and having this thing on casters with all of your tools all in one place with dust collection really came in handy. First thing I started doing was planing down the, the middle LVL on this beam. Uh, last year when I installed it, it stuck down a little bit further than the other ones, and I just need to make this thing flat on the bottom so that the boards that I'm going to wrap this with fit nice and flush. So after the prep work was done, I went ahead and started cutting down boards to wrap the post, and I could have done this in many different ways, but the way that my wife and I liked the most was red cedar. The nice thing about cedar is that it's more rot resistant, and the cool thing about these boards is they have three finished sides, in one kind of rough side. And we liked leaving that rough side out, which I think most people do for that kind of rustic look. Uh, you can see when I'm installing it here, I'm using a spacer board at the top and then nailing it in with my finish nailer. Uh, the nails that I'm using here are an inch and three quarter galvanized nails, and they have a, a decent size head on the top that's gonna hold these boards in, but all at the same time, it's not too big where you're gonna see it at the end. And then using this technique here, you can see that I can get away with installing some of these boards by myself. For some of these larger and wider boards where we're wrapping around the outside of the beam, I definitely needed some help. And 
And here you can see anytime I had two boards that were meeting together like this, instead of just butting them together, I jointed them at a 45 degree angle. I think this helps the joint look a whole lot cleaner and come together tighter, as well as I think it's going to hold up better to expansion and contraction over time. So at this point, I have half the posts and half the beams wrapped with cedar, and I felt like I had no choice but to go ahead and start applying a coat of finish to this. Uh, there were going to be some crazy thunderstorms predicted for that night, and I didn't want this exposed cedar to get wet. Um, when wood like this gets wet, it can soak in water and, ha and have staining, and I didn't want to ruin all that cedar that I just put up. So I went ahead and started coating this in a Hellman Spar Urethane. This is a clear matte finish, so I'm not trying to add any gloss to it. And you can see that I'm coating all faces, edges, and even the bottom so that it's not going to suck up any water like a straw and hopefully not stain it. Uh, you can see that as I'm applying this, even though it's a clear finish, it's really bringing out the red color of this. And I loved it. This, this really red color was awesome. And it's really that red color that I was looking for in the cedar. And as it dries, some of that red fades, but it still looks really awesome. As predicted, it rained, and it rained pretty hard that night. Lucky for me, the finish got pretty dry, and nothing got ruined. So I was pretty happy that I did this, even if it was a little bit out of order. Then moving on to the inside, wrapping the posts and beams in here just going to be a slight bit more difficult because we have some wires that we have to work around. To start, I'm actually going to start with a mitered cut on the end. And to be honest with you, I wanted to miter all the cuts when I was wrapping the posts and the beams in the cedar. Uh, but with expansion and contraction outside, I figured that a lap joint was going to be just as good. Having all these mitered corners, I don't know if the extra work was going to be worth the payoff in the end. And you can see that I'm, I'm kind of struggling with this one on the miter saw and was kind of proving my point, as you'll see here in a second. Uh, I started off with a miter saw, then I started cutting some of the miters on track saw. The track saw ended up working out really well, but no matter how well I made that miter joint, some of these larger pieces of cedar as they dried and they bowed or cupped in different directions, and so they're not 100% perfect, and trying to get these miters to line up was driving me nuts. And so that was a battle that I thought I was gonna fight with all the posts and beams, um, but I did wanna do at least these inside corners on the beams to try to make those look really nice. After that, I came back and made a groove for the wire to pass through the back of the board. To do this, I used the miter saw with a stop set and made a few passes through the board to almost make something like a dado back here. Then the little bit that was left over, I broke out with my fingers and then cleaned up the joint with a chisel just to make it a little bit easier to install. With a little help to line up the wire into the groove and then the miter at the end, these boards went up just like the rest of them. Then in an attempt to keep this miter joint looking good over time, I'm not only nailing it, but gluing it, using some Type Bond 3. This stuff's outdoor and water rated. And as you can see, as I'm installing this, it, it definitely doesn't fit right. But as I nail it, bends back and ends up looking pretty good. With the beams wrapped, I moved on to the posts. After cutting the board to length and marking out where the bottom of the box was going to be, I used this template to go ahead and mark off where I was going to cut the hole for the box to fit through. This time to make the groove, I use the dado set on the table saw.
after loosening the receptacle, I went ahead and finagled the box through the board. Uh, then I lined up the groove in the back of the board with the wire. Positioned it in place and nailed it in. Then the box got reinstalled to the post and the weatherproof cover got put on. I will admit, I really like this method of doing it because I don't have any exposed wire and I didn't have to use any conduit. The outlets are definitely still visible, but they do look clean and they kind of give you a nice little shelf to rest your phone while it's charging. With everything wrapped in cedar, the only thing left to do was to come back and put a coat of finish on everything that wasn't coated before. Moving out to the ends of the awning, I'm installing a bunch of channel here, nailing it up with the air nailer. And this was another one of those steps that felt like more prep work for a more substantial step later. This channel is going to cover the end of the tongue and groove. It's going to hold the bottom and the top of the siding. And it's also going to hold the soffit on the bottom of the overhangs. If we take a closer look at it here, it's hard to see, but on the inside, I have a three quarter inch vinyl J channel, which is going to hold the end of the tongue and groove on the outside. I have a 5 8 inch vinyl J channel that's going to hold the bottom of the siding. Then I have a 5 8 inch aluminum J channel on the top to hold the top of the siding. And then finally, I have an aluminum F channel that's going to hold the soffit. So I chose to install vinyl siding on the ends to try to match the house as much as I possibly could. That was kind of the goal with all this trim work was to make this look like it was part of the house. And choosing to install siding out here probably was not the easiest thing to do in the world. Hanging siding on a flat surface with long straight runs is pretty easy. Doing it in these kind of small pieces was, was not the easiest thing I've ever done in the world. Basically, we just cut the siding to the proper angle on the inside and the outside, a 412 on the bottom and a 612 on the top. And then you had to check the pieces to make sure that when you were installing them, they were relatively level. Um, and just worked our pieces all the way up to the top until they met the middle. And then there was just a tiny little piece that went in at the top um, and it wasn't held in there real nice. So I just used a little trim nail that nobody's really ever going to see just to tack that in at the top. Then the back side of the awning back here, the side over the house, which nobody's ever going to see, was actually the more rewarding side. Uh, just because it was a little bit more complicated, it took a whole lot more thinking and, and planning out to make sure all this stuff works, especially when you don't do this stuff all the time. Uh, but if you take a look here, you can see kind of a better look at how the, all those channels are coming together and how they're going to hold the siding, the tongue and groove, and the soffit in place. But this side was definitely more fun than the other side. The siding went pretty much the same on this side until we got to this piece. I was pretty proud of this piece, I'm not going to lie. Uh, it took some finagling to figure out the angles on this one and actually get it in place. It looks easy here. Uh, but it, it took a lot of work to get that one installed and in the correct position. Um, and I was pretty happy with the way that that came out. Then installing the soffit was pretty easy. The one little particular thing that I did with this was I started actually started at the peak uh, with a piece that I bent to the same pitch as the roof. And I did this just to make sure that I could have the center piece right at the top of the peak. No one's ever going to see this, but I really like the look of how the center of that piece lines up right at the peak. So I had to ins actually install this piece first, work my way down the left hand side, install those ones temporarily, then come back, renail them, put that piece in. And then I could finally come back down and work my way down the right hand side. Once down at the corner, the only problem that I had to solve here is how to blend in the, the sloped overhang to the flat overhang on the side. And you can see that I put a little piece of soffit in there with a board behind it to make like a little box. And once I had that box in there, that would hold the edge of the soffit. And I just kept moving down until I reached this electrical box. This electrical box is actually the junction box for the electrical boxes that go down the post. Then like many of the things that I've done on this project, I had never done before. And I think this actually worked out pretty slick. So here I cut a piece of soffit with the hole fit the line up with the box in the ceiling. Uh, then I screwed in the receptacle over the top and it helps hold that piece of soffit in even, even more so. And then put on the weatherproof cover and there's a foam backing on this that seals it up. So no water is gonna get up underneath that box anyway and make it into that electrical connection.
The soffit on the sides installed pretty easy until you had to stop at the corners and do that kind of detail work and then stopping again at the electrical box to, to do that. Kept going all the way to the end and finished out the last corner before we could start the soffit going up the overhang. Then yet again on the far side here, I wanted that same look that I had on the other side, that nice clean piece at the top that met at the peak. Uh, so what I had to do was temporarily install all of the pieces going down the left-hand side. And what I did was I marked out all of their joints or connection spots because I'm gonna have to remove these pieces so that I could nail them in. Then with all the pieces moved, I started out at the bottom on the left-hand side, re-put them in, make sure that they lined up to my markings that I put in earlier, and just nailed them all the way till I got the top, met to that piece on the top, and then worked my way all the way down the right-hand side. After I had all the soffit pieces in, I could start putting up pieces, pieces of fascia. This wasn't that bad, to be honest, but it would have been nice to have another pe person down there to hold it because these pieces are really easy to buckle. But really the most difficult part of installing the fascia was once you got down to the bottom corners, there was a, a significant amount of cutting and bending and folding that you had to do to get it looking correct. I'm going to say mine are perfect, but they ended up coming out better than I would have ever anticipated for somebody not doing this before. But at this point, all the fascia has been installed, and for all intents and purposes, besides gutters, the outside of this thing is 100% finished and watertight. Then moving on to the inside, it's time to go ahead and start installing the tongue and groove that I'm gonna be putting on the ceiling. Uh, these boards are tongue and groove boards, pine boards from, that I ordered from Menards. I tried to do something a little bit different here and I don't know that if I would do this again, uh, but these were special order boards that have this kind of hand carved type of look to it. It's a really awesome look and a really different look that I wanted to try. But because of that hand carved look, the boards aren't 100% flat. That ended up making it a little bit harder to install. And then I ordered these in 16 foot boards, thinking that I was going to have a whole lot less seams because of it. One thing that I learned pretty quickly was dealing with these 16 foot boards wasn't exactly the most fun thing in the world. Uh, only being three quarters of an inch thick and 16 feet long, they were pretty floppy. Then they're, the awning's only 18 feet wide, so moving them around was not the easiest thing in the world. But where it really became problematic was actually getting these things up on the ceiling. Moving them up and down the ladder and then trying to hold them up there on the ceiling definitely wasn't the easiest thing. I'm not saying it's impossible, uh, but having a second person to help install the 16-foot boards at least was really nice to have. The 4, 8, and even 12-foot boards that I was putting up, definitely I could handle doing those by myself. It wasn't that bad. I could lift those into place, kind of pound them into place a little bit, and then use clamps to hold them up temporarily until I got them all the way in place. To pound the boards in, I ended up using this deadweight hammer. It seemed to work really well. I didn't have to hit them that hard, but it had a little bit of force with it where I could pound that, that board into the groove. Another kind of tip that I used for these, it, because they were kind of irregular, not 100% flat, I ended up using some spacers that when I was installing these, I put a little spacer in between the back of each board and the truss just to give myself a little bit of space and it helped get the next row installed a little bit easier. Yet again, I'm using the same finish nailer and the same finish nails that I was using to install the cedar. And to the best of my ability, I'm trying to nail through the tongue and into the truss so that when you click that next row in, you're not going to be able to see any of the nail heads. Then the only other thing I had to do sometimes was use this nail punch or nail set to recess the, the head of the nail into the board. We weren't going to see any of these nails later. Overall, installing the tongue groove took a little bit longer than I wanted to, but it was a nice, slow, steady pace getting up to the lights. Then once I reached the lights, I adjusted them, moved them down a half an inch so that they would line up with a row of boards perfectly. Once I had the locations of the light marked on the board, then I used one of the trim rings to help me sketch out the hole that I was going to cut in the board. I traced in the inside of the trim ring for a reference, and then I also marked out the outside of the trim ring so I knew where it was going to cover. Then I came back and just made a hand-drawn sketch to give me a rough estimate of where I needed to cut. To cut this hole, I used a jigsaw, and I have it set at a 45 degree angle to back cut this board.
back cutting the board will make it a whole lot easier to install later because it's being installed at an angle. That back cut angle will kind of offset some of that and help it hopefully fit up a little bit better to the can light that I already have installed. When the board's installed, you can tell it's not 100% perfect fit, but once that trim ring goes on, me and you are the only people that are ever going to know. Then the next few boards kept going the same way. I just needed a little bit of help because they're longer 16 foot boards and instead of just one light in that board, they had up to three in some of them. Did that on the top and bottom and you can hopefully see that I adjusted these can lights. So the center of the can light meets up right with the seam of the two boards, half of a board on the bottom and half of a board on the top. Then the next tricky thing I ran into was the old roof overhang that was left here from the roof that was here before. Instead of running the boards and butting them up into it and, and putting in some other type of channel or something here, I elected to just cut this piece of roof off flush where the boards would intersect it. It actually cut off pretty easy and then I was able to just run the boards over top of it and let this part of the roof die into my new tongue and groove. The last board that ends up touching that part of the roof, I, I did something a little goofy here, maybe a little bit tricky, but I ended up cutting a groove in this board and installing a piece of flashing actually inside of the board. Then when that board was installed, you can see that piece of flashing hanging out over top of the roof there. So no water is going to be able to go back up under that board because I have that piece of flashing there. And then I also underneath that piece of flashing and behind it where you can't see, I put in a little bit of roof cement just to caulk that in there and make sure that, that we weren't going to have any issues, even though very, very little water is ever going to make it up there anyway. Then with the tongue and groove installed almost all the way to the peak, I had my next kind of decision to make here. Um, I did not want to make a flat spot at the top of this roof. I was really adamant about making it come to a complete peak. And the way that I ended up doing this was I created these boards here to go on either side. You can see that I cut the tongue off the back so that I can push it up and install it. And then the other side is cut to an angle so that it'll fit up there against another board and bring this whole thing to a complete peak. No flat spot, nothing else at the top. Not going to lie, these boards fought me a little bit more than they probably should have. That's why it's so dark out here and I'm working on these. Uh, these were a little bit frustrating to really push up in there and get them to fit. I think the overall fitment looked really good, but they did take some wrangling to get in there and get them nailed in. Then the last thing to do with the tongue and groove was to put a coat of finish on it just to protect it from the, the weather and the elements. In all honesty, this is not going to see really any water. The, the more than anything, it's going to see a little bit of UV light reflecting off of the pool and reflecting up on it and fading it. I'll be honest with you, I don't know if I use the 100% the best product for this. I went with a general finishes uh, water-based satin finish and the reason that I did this was because any oil-based product that I was trying to put on pine was really yellowing it. This being a water-based finish and having those white pigments in it was keeping it more close to that original color and I'll be honest it was actually really hard to put this finish on because it was hard to tell where I was going. I did the entire thing in one day which took a lot longer than you would think being up on a ladder working four boards at a time uh, but it took me quite a while to do this working into the night here. Then one of the last things to do was to have gutters installed. To prepare for that, I wanted to have a connection ready for them to connect to my existing downspout. To do that, I dug down and exposed my previous downspout, and then I dug a trench over to the post where the new downspout was going to come down. You can see as I'm digging this trench, I dig past a previously installed drain, which I installed a French drain there in a previous video. Um, and I really don't like connecting downspout drains into French drains. They're two different things, two different purposes. I guess I could have done it that way, but not the way that, that I wanted to do it. So it did make it a little bit more difficult. I did have to dig under the concrete a little bit, but I ended up creating a trench that flows downhill from where that new downspout location is over to the previous downspout. Then from there, I installed a solid corrugated piece of pipe that hooked into that previous downspout and then had a downspout connector uh, right at the base of that post for them to connect into. 
after filling back in the trench, putting back the rocks and everything like that, you really would never even know that I did anything. Really the reason that we filmed these, just so that I can tell my wife that I actually did something. And as I was kind of alluding to, the gutters were the only thing that I didn't do myself on this project. I had these professionally installed just because they could probably match the color a little bit better. And the big thing was that they could make solid runs. The, on the right and the left side, these are all solid runs. There's no seams or gaps or anything like that. So the odds of them leaking are way less. And then you can see over here on the right-hand side that they connected into that previous downspout that was used on my house before. Back on the inside of the awning, there's really not a whole lot to do other than some final finishing touches, one of those being installing ceiling fans. There's really nothing special about installing a ceiling fan except for kind of the little thing that I did at the top where it meets the roof. If you're installing a ceiling fan on a peak, a lot of times you have a little box up there. I elected to do something different and I designed a ceiling fan cover based on the original one that was cut to the peak of the roof. You can see that after designing it on CAD, I 3D printed it real quick. It's not a perfect color match, but when it's up 12 feet in the air, you really can't tell the difference. And here you can see the, the original ceiling fan cover that came with the fans and the one that I created. And I'm really actually pretty happy with the way that this looks at the end here. There's no box. It meets right nice and flush with the peak and it looks pretty clean. One of those small things that's gonna be hard to notice, one of the tiny detail things that I'm really happy with. Then the very last thing to do was install the trim rings around the recessed lights, and you can see that I painted these black to match the ceiling fans. And then at this point, this is where I pass my final electrical and final building inspection, so it's done. So like I said, this project's done, or at least it is for now. Um, this project represents probably the starting point, the biggest point of all of the other projects that I wanna do here in my backyard. This was the one I wanted to get done first, and there is gonna be so much more stuff to come in the future. But before I get kind of too far ahead of myself, and I don't think I need to even say it, but I'm pretty pumped with the way that this thing came out. Like I really like what I've created here. Um, going through the process of starting off by designing it here myself, getting the permits for it, building it, solving some of those problems that came along along the way that I didn't even know I was going to run into. Uh, yeah, it took a whole lot longer than I thought it was ever going to, but I think here in the end with the final product, uh, for me, it was totally worth it. It was exactly what I was looking for. That being said, there's going to be a multitude of different videos that come out here. Uh, I still have some finishing touches left to do. I have concrete that I need to, to finish up around the post to finalize that and make that look nice. I have a bunch of landscaping and a little bit of drainage stuff that I still want to do out here. Imagine that. Um, I want to get rid of the grassy area right next to the fence. It's a pain in the butt to mow. Every time you mow it, all kinds of grass gets under the patio and that's not exactly what I'm looking for. Uh, probably what I'm thinking now is kind of a ground level deck, maybe seven, eight inches above the ground, just to separate the two spaces, but give us a more usable space that we can put the grill on, put a patio, set of patio furniture out there. So you have an outdoor space and like a covered space. And then I think one of the things that I'm most excited about is mounting a TV out here. I found one of the coolest ways, but also one of the most expensive ways to probably mount a TV. And uh, that'll hopefully be coming in the spring after I build this patio furniture uh, so that we can properly enjoy the space out here. But if we're being honest, the reason you're probably still here watching is because you want to know what this costs. And I'm going to give that to you in a rough estimate. Um, I know exactly to the penny what it costs me to build this, but depending on where you're at, what the materials costs are, and a bunch of different variables, what tools you already have or need to buy, the price is going to fluctuate. So I want to give you a rough estimate of what you can expect wherever you live uh, for what something a building like this would cost. And, and this is an 18 by 24 foot 
covered structure. So the first cost that I had was rentals. I rented a mini skid steer with an auger attachment and really I rented it to do my fence. But while I had it, I used it to drill the four holes uh, that, that I used to put the posts in. Uh, I also rented a concrete cutoff saw that I, so I could cut the squares in the concrete so that I could put those posts in place. That was a total of $200. Then concrete for the footer and around the bottom of the post was $250. The posts themselves were six by six pressure treated posts. Those were $200. Then I had to buy six LVLs to make the beams. In total, that was $1,450. The trusses, I ended up ordering from Menards. They were a custom order truss. Those were $1,950. The roof sheathing or the plywood that I put on top of the trusses was $450. I bought shingles and all of the other roofing materials. The shingles were bought from the roofer that did the roof on the rest of my house the year prior, but I knew that I was gonna build this. So I bought all those shingles from him at a little bit of a discount. It was kind of nice. But uh, the reason that I did that was so that I had the same lot number and they all matched, whatever. Uh, that plus all the other roofing materials, the paper, drip edge, nails, that kind of stuff, that was $1,500. Then next was all the electrical. That's the wiring, light, ceiling fans, outlets, all of that assort assorted stuff was $1,500. Then I had the cedar that I wrapped the posts and the beams with, that was a thousand. The pine tongue and groove, which maybe I would have done that same thing again. I really liked the way it looked, but it was tough to install. That was $1,700. Fascia, soffit, siding, and all the channels that was associated with that was $600. I paid somebody $500 to put on the gutters. And then the last thing that I included in here was miscellaneous stuff. So there were tools that I may have bought. Maybe I bought one or two three air nailers. Did I 100% need them? Eh, maybe, but now I'm glad I, that I have them for other projects. Um, all the stuff that I did with the drainage, I already had all that pipe and most of those fittings laying around, so that wasn't a cost for me. There was a, a few other things that I had stuff that I already needed from other projects that went into this, but I threw in there an extra $700. And when you add all of that up and my priceless free labor, uh, it gets us to a grand total of $12,000. So $12,000 is what I would estimate in materials, if you're doing it yourself, the labor's free, that something like this would cost. Now, if you were going to a contractor or somebody, or you're gonna hire somebody to do this for you, I'll be honest with you, I have no idea what to expect and what that would cost. Um, I hope somebody out there is a contractor that's watching this and they can give us a rough price what they think in their area something like this would, would cost but I am willing to bet that it would probably be double, potentially triple what the material cost is. Um, I mean, if, if you have $12,000 in materials, those people aren't in business to not make money. They've gotta pay their workers, they have to make money themselves, they have to pay their insurance, they have to buy tools, all that good stuff. Um, so for $12,000, I think I have a pretty cool structure here, and I think that this is going to work really well for me in the future, um, and, and I'm already enjoying it. I think that it'll probably add value to my home. Will it add $12,000 worth of value? I have no idea, uh, but I wouldn't change it. I, I would have done it exactly the same way. So if you guys liked the video, I would really appreciate it if you hit the like button. Uh, if you want to tell me what you thought of this, if you have any further questions, please let me know in the comments. I really do like reading those. I, I just wish I had more time to answer all of those. And then if you want to see where I go from here with the rest of the awning, some of those things that I were mentioning or other future projects around my house, I would uh, urge you to subscribe. But other than that, I hope to see you in another video.